You're back with The Nation. Wellington's buildings have stood up well to the swarm of earthquakes over the past week. The city has some of the most stringent building regulations in the country. And in the next few weeks, the government will announce more changes to the Building Act. It's been consulting on proposals that would raise the minimum standards for all earthquake-prone buildings, and it follows on from what happened in Christchurch. And it will also change how long property owners have to comply or demolish those buildings. The meetings have been well attended all over the country, reflecting the level of concern amongst building owners. Of particular concern is the issue of heritage buildings and how remedial work will be funded. To discuss this, I'm joined in studio by Neville Brown from uh, Wellington City Council's Earthquake Resilience Manager in Wellington, Sir Bob Jones, Property Investor and Chairman of RJH Holdings, and in Blenheim, Bruce Chapman, CEO of the New Zealand Historic Places Trust. Good morning to you all and thank you all for joining us this morning. Neville Brown, if I can start with you, just <coughs> explain to us, if you will, what the government has been doing over the last few months. So the government set out on a consultation process following the Royal Commission uh, reports uh, later uh, last year and so they've put a number of propositions out uh, to the community for advice um, around the strength, around the timeline in which uh, people might have to strengthen buildings and, and kind of other issues around buildings that are not used as frequently as they could. Heritage buildings of course has been part of the consideration um, and, and those uh, results are close to being announced, it would seem. OK, so what are the main buildings that are likely to be impacted by this, do you think? Well, one way or the other, all buildings will be impacted because it's going to generate more than likely a change to the building code. But the immediate effect will be for those buildings uh, who, who are currently earthquake prone. And I think what the marketplace is looking for is a decision about whether 34%, which is the current minimum standard, is going to stay. We have building owners in Wellington who don't want to do strengthening until they have that surety. And then the other immediate change will also be on earthquake prone building owners around the length of time that they have to do the strengthening. OK, some suggest, uh, Sir Bob Jones, that it will be owners of uh, commercial property that are really going to be impacted here, bringing uh, buildings up to 34% of that um, the earthquake standard. Is the onus going to fall on people like you, property owners, to you know, address this issue, and pretty quickly. It's fallen on us for years, Rachel. Look, every building in this country was built to 100% of code. Then the years go by, and probably quite rightly, of course, they revisit it, and they say, this is not safe, that code, and they lift it up. Now, morally, if they've changed their mind, they should pay for it. Now, that happens every six or eight years. Now they're going to do it again. But they don't pay for it, they don't offer interest-free loans, they don't, um, uh, they don't even allow us to deduct that cost. They say, no, it's not an expense. Now, this is, most people can't afford it, yeah. and they keep lifting it. And that's why we have a problem, because it's simply not economic, they don't have the money. Most of the buildings that the previous speaker was talking about, the so-called heritage ones, an arbitrary declaration. But we spent tens of millions uh, bringing our building up to our buildings with one exception, which was not earthquake prime, but we were about to do it, a small one, the tenants didn't want to leave. Up to scratch, most people can't afford to do it. Why isn't it deductible? Obviously it's an expense. Neville Brown, what do you make of that? Some people are doing this already, aren't they, off their own bat in Wellington, yet th th not everybody can afford to spend $10 million bringing a building up to court. Couldn't, couldn't agree with Bob um, more than that. That's our view too. We have a whole range of buildings in Wellington that, that could be strengthened if there was a, some assistance from the government. And indeed, we've asked for that through uh, the consultation um, submission that we made, and we're also about to make separate submissions to government. So Bob, Jones, who should pay for it in your opinion? Well, morally, I think it's a very hard argument to say the people who keep changing their minds should. But probably people take this stuff on the chin. But not to let that be deductible, that's not an expense, that's ridiculous. The problem with this government is they don't like, or certain members of this government are important, but on record is not liking property people. It's a childish attitude. And they've got a bit of form there. Uh, it goes back, I think, to the days the AMP boss famously declared we're all Labour voters in the property industry. Well, they are, because uh, property people like active economies. You get active economies when you have Labour governments. The record's pretty clear on that. Now, and there is a, 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 a absolutely measurable prejudice 
against the property industry. It's quite childish. Somebody's got to supply these office buildings. They rent them from us, the government. They don't want to own them themselves. Now, obviously, at the very least, that expenditure should be deductible. OK, but how will this change in the meantime the commercial nature of our cities? Because you've just talked about uh, tenants previously. Tenants are going to become more selective. If you're in central Wellington and your building isn't up to a degree of code, then certainly tenants, I'm sure, are going to start getting fussy about where they want to be. They already are. We're a very big company. We're a very big company, and we can afford to outlay those tens of millions, and we did. I mean, it's been hugely advantageous to us because people who can't afford to do it, you're quite right. The tenants have all come to us. That's why we're pretty much a full house, allowing for a churn factor. But, I mean, after the earthquake on Monday, I came in on Tuesday. To, I don't go in very often. I came in to go to the dentist. I went over there. I couldn't move in the office. There were, and we've got big offices. It was packed with people. Packed with people saying, can we have some space? Uh, and so it actually works to our advantage. But, look... The city is full of people. They say it's all heritage, this sort of thing, up at Cuba Street. It doesn't add up for them to do it. They can't, haven't got the money anyway. And they're not even, even if they did, they can't deduct it. It is quite immoral. OK, Bruce Chapman, let me bring you in here from Blenheim. Of the 25,000 buildings that are earthquake prone, some 3,000 are heritage buildings. Can you, you know, economically, can you save them all? Well, Rachel, I think, uh, good morning, first of all. I think the issue here is that there are only about 3,000 uh, of those 25,000 unreinforced masonry uh, uh, heritage uh, buildings in, in New Zealand. And the issue for those is um, do we strengthen them or do we demolish them? And the same affordability issues apply for, uh, for those buildings as apply for, to all of the other 25,000 buildings. Realistically, it is unlikely that um, under the, the current settings or the settings that have been proposed, we will actually be able to, to, uh, to save all of those buildings. Um, and the question arises, therefore, is, as uh, Neville and Bob have said, um, you know, how do we go about funding uh, those, the, uh, the survival of those buildings? How do you do that, then? How do you well, there are a number of ways that uh, councils are currently using. There are, there are a relatively small uh, incentives available to people around the country, but the, the difference for heritage buildings is not the question of do we demolish um, the buildings or, uh, you know, or, or, or repair them. It's actually about conserving them. What we have to do is to find um, the type of incentive mechanisms that will cross the divide between demolition and strengthening and uh, conservation. Okay. Now, there are a number of councils around the country that are using those methods at the moment. Auckland Council has transferable development rights. Um, another a bunch of councils are using um, consent fee waivers. Some are using uh, very permissible zoning provisions. Um, others are using low interest loans. Dunedin City is using that. Um, some councils have chosen to purchase buildings, upgrade them and then on sell them. So there are techniques that are being used. But um, it is a very significant issue for owners. The issue, if you like, Bruce, is crystallised by the public trust building in uh, Wellington because Creative New Zealand has said, of all people, have said it will never go back after the 6.5 quake. It's just not going to go back into that building. So what do you do about the public trust building in Wellington? Well, clearly buildings of that nature will have to be strengthened. Um, it's, it's a very important building from a heritage perspective. Um, our view is that it can and should be strengthened and, uh, and it, it is a question then of finding the funds to do that. And, and if, it, if the funding is, is such, or the, the demand for funding is such that it's not feasible, um, then we need to look at that issue pretty carefully at the time. Neville, what do you think we should be done? Should be done about the public trust building? Oh, look, our, we, our view is that should be should be strengthened and saved, and we understand from initial engineering views it can be. Uh, the question, of course, is cost, and that that does sit with the building owner. But given that it's a, a significant building, we also wonder whether the government has a role in here. Oh. Sir, <laughs> Sir Bob Jones. <laughs> Well, I know the building, I know every building in Wellington, and that building is, has not got an owner, it has several owners, and one of the owners uh, uh, is a High Court judge and a prominent barrister, and I recall um, talking to them about this, and they were indignant. They said, when we bought this, our share in this building, we were assured it was up to code. They keep changing the bloody code. Now, uh, if you're going to do that, I repeat what I said, you've got to say, well, if, if we want to change the rules on you, we should bear that expense. It's simply not fair. But not to allow it to be deducted is ridiculous. But the danger with that building, here's the thing you overlook, you may well find that the structure's perfectly okay. In the most cases, the structures are. 
It's bits falling off. That building has millions of twirly bits. Well, you could save it by simply replacing all those... They are dangerous, falling on people, you see. Mm. Uh, and we saw and that you, in Christchurch. You, Yes, and you can, you know, replace those out of uh, some sort of artificial light material that bounce off your head. Uh, and that is the problem. We don't build buildings like that for two reasons. A, there is a safety issue, and B, nobody wants them anymore. Uh, if, we, if people wanted them, we'd be building them like that. But you get the historic places people who have a different view about them, but they are dealing with private property, and there should be more... Uh, awareness of that, I believe. But should we be paying to preserve these heritage buildings, uh, Sir Bob Jones, or at what stage do you say, look, this just is not viable, bring it down? Well, I think you can go back one step. You can say, well, who's to determine? Well, we have a, an arrangement who determines, but we could argue a, a lot about some of those determinations. I mean, I do know a bit about this, and I've had experience both here, Hawaii, and, and Australia with listed buildings. We, we had a large building in Sydney once, it was just built. And it was a very large building, a third of a billion dollars uh, in value. And a certain, the day it was finished, we'd bought it from, uh, from the developer, they slapped a, a listing on it. Now, there were architectural errors in it that we couldn't do anything about because, uh, oh, you can't touch it now. Another case is the cost of taxpayer, I think from memory, about $60 million to build the new Supreme Court and do up the old court. The... Uh, the, uh, the um, Ashan Elias did not want that sort of Supreme Court. She, did, she wanted a Privy Council intimate type court. Right. Now, they did that because the, the, all she wanted was some changes in the old court where she wanted to go. No, you can't do that, said the uh, heritage people, and therefore we had to spend $60 million okay. and build one next door. Bruce, tell us what you think on that, because, you know, Sir Bob has just suggested that you could put, you know, some sort of plastic type fixtures on the, outs <laughs> on the outside of some of these heritage buildings and be done with it. It looks the same. How would, you know, a Historic Places Trust view that sort of alteration, if you like? I think for ornaments and, and uh, uh, appendages of that nature, parapets, they can actually be tied back and, uh, and in, in some cases um, replaced with lightweight materials. Um, that is a viable option that we have um, agreed to in the past. Um, but I take issue with Bob's comments about um, New Zealanders' attitudes towards heritage. It's, this is not just the Historic Places Trust saying this. Um, we undertake a survey every year that, um, that asks New Zealanders about their attitudes towards uh, heritage conservation. And, and this year and previous years, on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, more than 50% of New Zealanders have said that they do value and recognise the need to protect New Zealand's historic heritage. Um, that, that proportion has increased every year, and, and that, that's, that's during the period of the Canterbury earthquake. So I think public sentiment is, is, is very much aligned with the need to, to recognise that these these buildings actually add character to our cities. Um, they remind us of who we are as New Zealanders. Uh, they're actually pretty important to try and keep. Um, the issue of funding them, though, is, is, I agree with Bob and Neville, is a very significant issue, and it's one where, on occasions, um, governments will need to come in and, as I've mentioned, the local, local authority examples, uh, perhaps central government does have an additional role there as well. It is a very difficult line, Neville Brown, that is walked, isn't it? Because it it's, and we've seen that in Christchurch too, it's the head versus the heart. and, and it's a difficult line you will walk in Wellington too. Well, absolutely, and and you know, we've been considering how how and what options there are for helping heritage building owners. Um, I guess our view that we've arrived at is that it can't always be the ratepayer um, because uh, because they don't always have an interest in the commercial areas of the city. So therefore, but that said, our community has said heritage is important, and we have a couple of mechanisms in place to help building owners, and we're researching a couple more that we might be able to put in place. What do you think is going to come from what the government is, is, has been looking at? What, you know, what, what potentially could be some of the new regulations that we may see? Well, potentially, if, if it goes the way of the consultation document, we will see a reduced timeline uh, for because the Because at the moment it's five years, isn't it, to declare whether a building is earthquake prone and then ten years to either make those changes or demolish it. That's a long time. Well, that, that's what's being proposed in the consultation document. And what we said in our, in our submission is we think that's fine for Wellington, but we're well advanced in that process. And we don't think that will work for other areas in New Zealand. So we think it's fine to have a national standard, but the way it's implemented will need to be strictly tailored to, one, the level 
level of risk and also the affordability and doability uh, of that work in, in other centres because we, we all need seismic engineers and they're, uh, they're a scarcity right now. Indeed. Neville Brown, Manager of Earthquake Resilience at Wellington City Council. Okay. So Bob Jones and uh, Bruce Chapman, thank you all for your time this morning.